I'm Olive Jones. I'm a, currently a PhD candidate at the University of Waikato in the North Island of New Zealand. I'm 51 years old. I have, I'm in the third year of my PhD, hopefully completing this year, and um, have been back at university for probably four years, five, four years. Before that, I spent seven years as a primary school teacher. Before that, I was fairly freelance. And long before that, I was a communard, lived communally for 16 years. Yes, my formative years, my, you know, those years when you're a young adult finding who you are and what you're going to do with your life, my, those years for me were intensely spent living communally and, and they were spent living, living communally in a utterly immersed way. I was fully engaged in the communities that I lived in. I had absolutely no money, so everything I did was about self-sufficiency. I totally believed in independence from the state and the concept that we could make just about everything that we needed or, or, or produce everything that we needed. Well, I can say that now probably in hindsight. I don't think I was a political animal as a 17-year-old when I left school and um, went there. In New Zealand in the 1970s it was a very um, conservative, tight little world. Small population, totally isolated, hugely English model. Um, school system was, you know, the girls did cooking, the boys did woodwork. Um, when the, the top sort of 5% went to university. School was streamed so you were either academic, professional or general and the vast majority of people were in the professional stream and for a girl in the 70s in New Zealand professional meant you were going to be a teacher, a nurse, a secretary or perhaps work in a bank. And None of, the, none of that appealed to me. I started off in the academic stream but I just couldn't stand academic people. They had no sense of humour and they were terribly good and so consequently was totally rebellious at school and came time the, the, it came time to leave school and I didn't have any options. <laughs> But I'd seen these hippies that were starting to appear and they just looked incredibly exciting to me. And I was walking down the street as a teen young teenager and there was this guy, a guy, my eyes were on stalks. He had this long blonde plait right down to his ass. I'd never ever seen a man with long hair. And it completely blew my mind. And he had on these fantastic overalls that were all patchwork with all these different colours. And um, anyway, I hitchhiked to the South Island looking for adventure and romance, basically. That was my plan <laughs> when I left school. And hey, I ended up in a commune. And very quickly went, this is fantastic. It was kind of a whole mix. It was the rebel, it was the pre-Raphaelite women in their beautiful long velvet dresses. It was the, you know, the romance of milking cows by hand and having the wooden yoke on my shoulders. Tess of the Durbervilles, you know. All my teenage romantic fantasies all got rolled into one. And before I knew it, I was involved in this commune. But I was 10 years younger than everyone else. I was 17. Most of the people who were in this group were in their mid-20s, late 20s. And I just worship them, I thought they are fantastic. Now I look back and I think it was fairly out there, the life that I led. Not in a positive way on a personal level, but on a um, living a life absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You know, learning how to make leather. I had a 
flock of sheep. I learned how to shear sheep and weave wool and make cheese and uh, keep animals. I built a house for myself. Really wonderful, wonderful things. And that's why I mean that they were kind of seminal experiences. So from the age of 17 until my early 30s, my entire life was involved in this kind of lifestyle, you know. Made the leather, then made the boots to wear. The satisfaction from doing that is incredible, you know. You don't go, why am I doing this? You go, I'm doing this because I need boots and I haven't got any money. And I really like the idea of making my own boots because the boots from town were made in China or, you know. So it became a, a definite way of life. However, Renaissance was also absolutely idealistic in that, you know, you and me and him and her and anybody else, we can all live together on this land because everybody has the right to live on the land, which is a fine ideal. But as I said in my paper, we just attracted people. We attracted strongly individualistic people, and which is kind of like the arch opposite of communal or socialist. But we also attracted really um, of the airy fairy types who had all the dreams but were completely impractical. Like, you know, I'm a vegetarian and we have no money and we have a farm full of animals and we eat meat because meat is what we produce, that kind of thing. So we'd have people who would want to go to the health food shop and buy, you know, boxes of dates and really nice, expensive vegetarian food. So there was all those sorts of things going on.